Hadoop was created in 2003. In the early years, Hadoop provided large-scale data processing with MapReduce and distributed fault-tolerant storage with the Hadoop Distributed File System. Over the last decade, Hadoop has evolved rapidly with the support of a big open-source community. Today's guest is Mike Caffarella, co-creator of Hadoop. Mike takes us on a journey from past to present. Hadoop was based on the Google File System and the Google MapReduce papers. So Mike and I talk about what it was like to work on a distributed file system and a big data processing system that were based on white papers that just came out of Google. We also discuss Yarn and the wave of innovation that Yarn has sparked within the Hadoop ecosystem. Before we get to this episode, let's hear from a sponsor who helps keep Software Engineering Daily consistent, available, and partition tolerant. Engineers love automation, and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. You wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing, get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. Mike Caffarella is a co-creator of Hadoop and is an assistant professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. Mike, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks very much. I'd like to start with some discussion of Hadoop's past. The way that you came to building Hadoop was from your encounter with scalability issues within the Nutch web crawler project. What were the challenges of building a web crawler in the early 2000s? Well, you know, Nutch was a web crawler, but it was also uh, a soup to nut search engine. At least that was the intention. So uh, Doug Cutting, before we started the Nutch project, had worked for a few years on a project called Lucene, which was a basic inverted index tool. So uh, that's the, the core data structure that makes search engine style queries go fast. That's how you can search through the billions of documents inside Google or other search engines in way less than a second. Um, so, so Lucene and the inverted index tool had been there, but we didn't have things like a, a, web, a web crawler like you described. But we also didn't have a, another core part, which is the database of all the URLs out there. So uh, as the web crawler runs, you have to track which URLs have you seen, uh, which ones still have to be crawled, which ones are likely dead, and so on. And so when we, uh, in addition, finally, you've got the, the ranker, you know, the, the live query processing system, which is what uh, a lot of people think of as they, when they think of as the, the core technical part of a search engine. So, so the, the new parts of Nutch were those three things, really, the crawler, the page database, and the ranker. And um, the crawler itself had pretty good scalability uh, at that time. We were capped more by our uh, the availability of network bandwidth than by anything else. You know, Doug mm. and I, when we were working on it in the very early days, we're really working on this thing, you know, out of our spare bedrooms with like uh, a, a cable modem attached. So we, we, we didn't really have a ton of bandwidth available. Uh, but we were able to saturate basically whatever network links you could give us. So um, with a, a fairly reasonable amount of computation, we could do a good job. So eventually you ran into the scalability issues and you and Doug decided that you needed a distributed storage layer. Tell me about when you got to that point and what what the requirements were for the distributed storage system that you needed. Yeah, so you know about after working on Nutch for a little over a year, uh, we had built a system that could crawl uh, and obtain 
uh, pages for and build the index for about 200 million pages. And when I say about 200 million, that's really 200 million pages with a one month freshness. Now that, that might seem kind of crazy because nowadays you go to Google and you have like a one minute freshness. But back in 2002, the bar was a little bit lower. Uh, it was considered totally okay at the time. As long as you got these pages within about a month, you know, everyone's fairly happy. You could, your pages could be updated and go a long time before those updates would ever show up, even in Google or professionally run search engines, not, you know, not just the search engine we were working on. And so the, the limiting factor for that 200 million was basically the disk yeah, yeah, seek time. That if you looked at uh, how much um, you, uh, work we were doing in a month, the, excuse me, the, a combination of the seek time and also the read-write bandwidth of the disk. So in order for us to get past that 200 million per month page limit, we had to have a distributed system that could actually uh, you know, process that page database uh, in, a, in a distributed fashion. Right. And until late 2003, there was no easy answer to solving all of these problems that uh, would be required to solve a distributed storage system. Uh, but in October 2003, the Google File System paper came out, which gave you the solutions that you needed. But I'm curious about the ideas that you were tinkering around with, that you were thinking about before you had access to the GFS paper and uh, sort of had the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly the GFS paper was great. You know, um, we we had basically had we basically had a homebrew solution at that point, one that was really customized for slinging around portions of the index or portions of the pages, meaning like the, the naming scheme was really driven by um, simply you know, what web pages we had seen and it was not the flexible kind of Unix style namespace. Uh, moreover, we didn't have a lot of the built-in um, failure robustness primitives that are inside GFS. So when the GFS paper came out, it, it was very clear that that was a, uh, a better way to go and would not only because it would offer those services, but we could reuse it for different other parts of the search engine. Like we could use it to store the search access logs, which we didn't, admittedly, we didn't really have a ton of search engine logs at the time because, you know, not a lot of people <laughs> were running much, but we had big dreams. So we thought, oh yeah, I mean, we're going to get those logs any day now. We're really going to need G something like GFS to handle it. Um, and so uh, that, that as soon as it came out, it became a very, very clear that that would be a, a very useful thing. And so uh, Doug and I spent some time working on that. What were the breakthrough concepts of the Google file system? So, you know, I think the, it was certainly true that you could get large amounts of storage back then because EMC and NetApp would sell you a large network attached device, but they were used at least when used best for you know, large database deployments. Partially, and partially because of that, their cost per gigabyte was simply astounding. Like in an, it, they were incredibly expensive. If you use them for something that wasn't you know, actually transactions on your system, if you used it for like storing your email attachments, which a lot of people did back then, this is a very financially ineffective thing to do in life. Pretty effective if you're EMC or NetApp, but not very effective for anyone else. And so for me, the the real breakthrough of GFS and why the guys who wrote that paper you know, were really caught on to something great was, was to note that for their workloads, which were not heavily transaction driven, these, this was not like a bunch of people all trying to take money out of their Visa account simultaneously. These are really workloads that looked more like slow moving kind of um, file system accesses that you and I would recognize as by accessing parts of our local computer's disk, that for a certain class of workloads, you could build a distributed file system at vastly lower price than these uh, previous mechanisms, like the NetApp or EMC devices. Um, and the reason that you could do that is that you could you know, use cheap distributed components um, you could simply copy data back and forth in order to get robustness. The, the financial overhead to building a very large and um, failure-resistant file system was, was very small. So it was, in some ways, it was the ability to give these kind of uh, failure recovery and large disk style uh, semantics at a very reasonable economic price 
that to me was the you know the reason that the GFS paper is still worth reading today. Mm. So the the conversation around distributed systems today is much different than it was in the early two thousands. Um, and you know today the like you said the idea of commodity storage and and expectation of failures. Um, and building the system such that it expects failures. Yeah. Th- those are, um, you know, everybody everybody knows about that. And, and also programmers have abstractions like Zookeeper that help us deal with distributed systems. Yeah. Um, but I'm really curious about what it was like back then, you know, 10, 13 years ago. Yeah. How were people thinking about distributed systems? Well, you know, I, I think that in research labs by the mid to late 90s, people had begun building these systems that were um, built on commodity components. So um, Inc. to me was a search engine kind of outsourcing company. Um, they ran their own search engine, but they also powered search engines from other people. And that came from a project at Berkeley that was really driven, you know, the, the first idea behind it was driven not by a desire to build the best search engine like the Google guys wanted to do, but rather in an effort to look for a great demonstration application of their distributed commodity processing platform. And to my knowledge, Ink to Me is the first company, I believe Ink to Me was founded in the mid nineties. The first company to do any of this in a commercial setting. If you look at the kind of hardware that a lot of search engine or web companies were using in the mid to late nineties, it was a lot of very, um, by expensive sun gear, by very large multiprocessor stuff, where you had a relatively small number of very expensive machines. The the work done by Ink to Me, and then I've really substantially f- furthered by the guys at Google, took the totally opposite approach, which is to use as many cheapo boxes as they could get their hands on, and and they, you know the people at the time had a like a, an economic systems argument, which is you know the per processor a 64 processor machine is always going to be a lot more expensive because designing the machine is more expensive. It'll always be cheaper to just go get these one or two processor commodity boxes and um, exploit economies of scale. You'd have to, I, I'm no longer an expert in whether that is still the case. Uh, you know, now, nowadays with the rise of multi-core systems, uh, having 64 processing units on your machine is not as unusual or as surprising as maybe it used to be. Uh, and certainly the economics of it are very different. So it's an open question as to whether this is still the best way to, to write a lot of systems. My take is that it may not be like that, that the, mm. the gas left in the tank of making, of pushing everything to this super cheapo commodity model uh, has, we're probably coming to the end if not already there. Um, mm. But uh, but at the time, this was really a, a, a very different way of thinking about it. The stuff, the, the reason that GFS and even to a greater extent MapReduce to me were, were really interesting is uh, they provided some services like failure recovery and resistance to failure or robustness in the face of failure that were not widespread in the data management world at the time. Uh, since it was assumed that queries would run very rapidly, there was rarely a need to partially recover from your queries like you can if half your machine, if your MapReduce jobs, half your MapReduce machines fail. MapReduce, of course, is meant for running very long-running jobs over a vast number of machines, some percentage of which will almost certainly fail. And so that requirement became much more necessary uh, when implementing MapReduce. Nowadays, that idea that you should be able to partially recover from a failure, that your job should still run in the face of uh, intermediate or inter- intermittent or partial failure, that's really been internalized, I think, at both the research level and at the mm. high industrial level. And so that, that to me, even though I think I don't, in five years, I don't know how many more people are going to be running MapReduce programs. I, I, I think the number is already pretty <laughs> small, actually. But that idea is kind of its lasting intellectual impact. And, mm. and again, is, an, uh, is a reason to read that paper. I, I, think, I think GFS and HDFS, they'll probably be deployed for a really long time. MapReduce, I don't know how long it's going to be deployed for. But that idea that you should be uh, that... Failure is over going to be, always going to be with you and that your jobs have to keep going, even in the face of partial failure. That idea has really been internalized and will keep going. Mm. 
Yeah, and I I listened to a podcast that you did with uh, Ben Lorica. Yeah. I think you talked about how, uh, I guess in the past and in academic systems, uh, probably around the time where when you were implementing Nutch, um, the the standard operating procedure for a partial failure is like restart the entire system. I well, guess. yeah, but that, that sounds worse than it is because I mean the systems at the time were like transaction <laughs> processing systems, right? And so, so rest- I, they had very few nodes. You know, they didn't. There were a few nodes, and they were generally really high quality machines, so they didn't fail that often. It wasn't a ridiculous thing to do. It only oh, becomes okay. ridiculous when you have like a warehouse full of crummy machines. <laughs> okay, so throughout two thousand four, you and Doug Cutting were implementing the Nutch distributed file system, the NDFS, which later became HDFS. Tell That's me right. about a particularly difficult implementation detail that you dealt with when you were building NDFS. Well, you know, one thing uh, was this an implementation detail. There, I mean, there's one bug that really stood out to me. Well, um, <laughs> you know, there a core part of Google, the Google file system, a, a design idea that we blatantly ripped off from them, was you have replicas of your different. Uh, you you have a, a file a file that's broken into chunks, like it happens in whether it's your local file system or many distributed file systems. And each of those chunks is replicated several times on different machines. Okay. There's a master node whose job it is to make sure that there's always at least K copies of each chunk going, you know, that are live and available at any one time. So if you've got, you know, some important file, the first, say, 64, gigab- 64 megabytes of it are copied in three different locations. If one of those locations becomes inaccessible because the machine fails, now you're down to two copies, and that master node's job is now, boy, I only got two copies. I better make another copy before something even worse happens, right? Well, I remember very clearly that in the, in the first version, in fact, in the first probably few weeks of the system, you, you'd have a file system full of files. You'd have many, many chunks in each machine. One, let's say you've got 64 machines. One of those machines goes down, and now a 64th of all your chunks like go below the threshold and need to be copied. The, if you've got a large number of chunks, if you do this naively, now you've got some absurd number of copy tasks to go out. Let's uh-huh. say there's several thousand chunks on every machine. I remember it was really hard to debug this because as soon as one machine went down, then the rest of the machine, the rest of the system just went into panic mode. It started copying, sort of opening <laughs> thousands of like, parallel TCP IP connections to copy everything across the cluster. So it was incredibly worried about being safe, but was so obsessive compulsive about it that it made the system like, unusable until all those copies had finished. And in fact, creating so many connections simultaneously, of course, made the total throughput much less than it otherwise would have been. So, so that was not, I mean... Was that an implementation problem? I, it was certainly a, a hassle of a bug to fix. Um, <laughs> and, and it was notable, uh, not because it was actually that hard to find. In fact, kind of just the opposite. That when it happened, it was comically obvious to everyone what was happening. That, uh. the, that if you were running sort of standard uh, diagnostics of what was on the network, you would go from you know, half of 1% utilization to 100% utilization just instantaneously. Uh, and so you, know, you had to put various forms of like... Um, budgeting and tapering on this sort of thing to prevent it from paralyzing the cluster whenever a, even the smallest uh, error took place. So mm. so th- th- that, w- that was one interesting thing to fix early on. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, if, if, you, if you hear the story of Hadoop, you may get the mistaken impression that like, you know, the, the Google file system paper comes out and then it's just like this recipe and then the Nutch distributed file system can just be implemented by following the recipe. But that's not really the reality. Like, um, and, and, you know, so for example, we, we did a show recently about the React database, which is an yeah. implementation of the Amazon Dynamo paper. Mm-hmm. And the lesson that I took away from that is that it's, it's certainly useful to have a paper to refer to for how to build a system, but it's by no means a like, complete recipe. Oh, um, sure. So, so, so I'm curious about like what what were the aspects of the GFS paper that you had to figure out for yourself to construct in DFS? That's a good question. I mean, that was certainly one of it. I would say in general, a lot of the 
rate limiting and uh, pl- capacity planning and so on, which are referred to very slightly, if at all, in the original GFS paper, are things that we had to explore quite a lot. So mm-hmm. how do you figure out like, where to put a new block or new um, chunk when it arrives into the system? One thing that we that is not mentioned at all in the paper, as far as I recall, is let's imagine that a, a bank of machines go down and it's not because their disks were destroyed. They simply became, so they, they pa- were powered down for a little while. Those chunks get copied. Then the machines come back up. Now you've got more chunks than you really need. Now more replicas of those chunks than you really need because you, know, you made one when it looked like you were down a little bit, but those machines came back online. It turns out that that, I didn't think about that too much initially, but that process of some machines going down and then coming back up is in fact extremely common. And unless you have the system constantly on the lookout, you not only for replica counts that are too low, because that suggests kind of dangerous safety for the file system, but also pruning the replica counts that are too high, then you can really quickly saturate all of your storage with just wholly unnecessary copies of a lot of the data going back and forth. And so that, that's something that never would have occurred to me um, you know, until we had actually gone through and seen that phenomenon in practice. I don't believe it's referred to in, in the original paper text. Mm, okay. Interesting. Um, so let's fast forward to MapReduce. So you you had uh, NDFS built. Um, when the MapReduce paper came out of Google, did you instantly realize that it was a good fit to build on top of NDFS? Yeah, well, you know, we 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 had we got further with the distributed implementation than maybe we did with the storage stuff when when GFS came out. So by the time MapReduce came out, we had a, a, a totally working distributed index construction mechanism. And moreover, you know, we we knew that there were existing distributed programming frameworks like um, message passing. Um, I don't I don't remember the state of the libraries for Java at the time, but certainly like that, the idea of of using message passing for pr- or distributed programming had been around in kind of universities and certain labs for a long time. People use it for like scientific programming. What what was really clear to me though was that there's probably going to be a greater need for distributed programming because now we had all these machines storing your data. And further, that the existing frameworks for distributed programming were way too complicated for typical programmers. <laughs> and so to me, MapReduce seemed fantastic. I was like, hey, it's going way up the stack. Like, um, you know, it's, it's doing a lot for the programmer. You can be a fairly okay, not super elite programmer and still get a lot done with MapReduce. Now that was, I, I, I will say that like you know we were right about that part. Maybe the part where you know, where my opinion now differs from what it did like when we were working on MapReduce is we should have gone even further up the stack, which is to say the things that people were doing with MapReduce. Okay, there was index construction, and for that you really needed MapReduce. But most of the other things, like for log analysis, like for a, or for a lot of the the read-focused MapReduce jobs that were like doing a vast read of something and then computing an answer, these looked an awful lot like SQL queries. And what's happened since is that basically everyone has decided we really need a much higher level language for writing like a large family of these things that we used to have to use MapReduce for. MapReduce, uh, it was great for writing inverted index construction, uh, you know, some graph processing, a few other things. But very quickly, it became clear there was a really large analytical workload that would be really well served by a, a much even higher level language, which something akin to SQL is probably the right thing to do. You know, very shortly after we had the MapReduce implementation, there was Hive, which compiled SQL into um, MapReduce. There was Pig, which did something very similar, although the Pig language looks a little bit different from SQL. Um, it does many of the same things. And of course, nowadays, you've got Impala and other things. Which, which, which don't compile into MapReduce, but the same idea that they identified a great workload and then created a high-level language for that per se. Your company has important projects that need to get done. The iOS app needs to be rewritten for Android. The database needs to be migrated. Your continuous deployment system needs to be built. The website needs a complete redesign but you don't have enough software engineers and designers to get all this work done. 
TopTal is here to save you. TopTal gives you exclusive access to the top 3% of freelance talent. Software engineers and designers, from Python to PHP, TopTal has the freelance talent you need to get your projects finished on time with top quality. In the past, we had to worry about flaky freelancers with poor communication skills, unreliable internet connections, subpar technical skills, and so on. TopTal screens for these kinds of things and only works with seasoned professionals with tremendous problem-solving skills, personality, and drive. Here's how it works. TopTal's internal team of senior engineers will work with you to understand your project scope and your talent needs, and they will custom match you with just a few hand-picked candidates. This means that whenever you need to add top-shelf talent for a critical project, you can be connected with pre-screened engineers who are hand-picked for your needs. And the results are impressive. TopTal clients conduct just 1.7 interviews for every hire that they make. All you need is to come ready with some decent technical specifications of your project, and TopTal's team of engineers will take care of you from there. If you are looking to add critical talent fast and you need a source you can trust, go to toptal.com slash se daily. You can also send me an email directly at softwareengineeringdaily at gmail.com, and I will personally introduce you to the team at TopTal so that you can learn more. We live in unique times. The nature of work is changing, and more and more industry-leading companies from Airbnb to JP Morgan are realizing the benefits of scaling quickly and staying flexible by working with elite freelancers. So if you're short on resources for your projects, check out toptal.com slash se daily. Thanks to TopTal for sponsoring the show. Now let's get on with this episode. In that interview that you did with Ben Lorica recently, you, you mentioned that there was this pushback from the database community uh, when uh, MapReduce was yeah, yeah. popularity. Like from Mike Stonebreaker, uh, for example, like in, what was it like MapReduce? Uh, one step uh, forward, yeah, two giant steps step back backward, or something. a big, huge step back or something like that, yeah. Right. So what what were the the criticisms of MapReduce and, and how were those borne out in reality? I don't, I, you know, that, that, that was like 07 or 08 that, that, that their article came out, I think. Um, I don't remember every single thing about it. Um, the, the, the salient points that are, the, my, my recollection of it now is they had a few different specific reasons they disliked MapReduce substa- you know, tremendously. And if I look back on it, you know, I, I, I did this exercise about six months ago or so. I looked at like which of their arguments actually looked the best you know, from the hindsight of you know, seven, seven years later. And that high-level language one was one of them. And, and they were totally correct on that. I, I didn't catch it at the time, but they were entirely correct that for a substantial workload, MapReduce was just way too low level. You know, in, the, in the history of databases, it used to be that when you had a new query, you basically had to write a new program for it. That, that was the case um, basically until the, sometime in the 70s or 80s. And one of the, the, the modern version of databases where, in which you write a query that describes the data you want, and it's up to the database system to figure out the most efficient way of getting that data. So if you say, like, I want um, you know, to count the number of people whose last name begins with X or something like that, there might be a few different ways the database can get that. Like it could do a flat scan of all the data. It could try to look up every single person whose last name begins with X using a special index structure. It might have a bunch of different options. And the fact that, in principle, the user of the system doesn't have to know about those options, but rather just describes the data they want, and hey, system, you figure it out. That's something that we take for for granted nowadays. It works really well, but it took a lot of arguing and a lot of systems building throughout the 70s and 80s to get to that point. But once we got to that point, it was a huge productivity boost, right? It was really a great thing for everyone to work on. Like, it was good for the universe that that happened. You can say that writing a raw MapReduce program, again, for this, this subset of all MapReduce workloads, which is a large, a large subset, but not, not 100% of it, 
it was like going back to the days where you had to write a custom program for every query. I, that, that you couldn't just write a really short, succinct description of it, have the system figure out the most efficient way of implementing it, and then, and then let it run wild. But did, were people thinking that MapReduce was actually going to be the low-level version of a, of a higher-level query language like Hive at that time? No, see, that's why, that's why the, I think, that's why I think that, that, that article was so controversial at the time, because it was, MapReduce at the time was just kind of making the transition from something that a few like, operating systems or distributed systems and like search engine enthusiasts knew about to something that a lot of people who were slinging data around had to know about. And if you looked at it from the perspective of, like, here's this pretty useful tool that lets me solve a lot of scalability issues in my search engine, then it was great. It was like a real Swiss army knife. I, I, I didn't view it as a replacement for SQL. I reviewed it as a replacement for a for loop. Okay. Right. But if you come at it from a data management perspective, uh, which is like, hey, a lot of people are now doing analytical workloads. <laughs> it looks like rank nonsense, right? Because it looks like a, a crappy version of the system that you built 15 years ago. Um, and so 20 years ago, I guess, from the pers- perspective of the, of the late 2000s. Um, and so I can, I can understand in retrospect exactly why it got everyone's dander up at the time, like on both mm. sides. That's fascinating. Uh, okay, so getting back to the the historical narrative of Hadoop, in 2006, Doug pulled NDFS and MapReduce out of the Nutch code base and created the Hadoop project. Yeah. When did Hadoop start to get adopted by lots of big companies? Well, you know, that 06 or so was roughly when Yahoo started investing a lot into it. So... Um, you, they, that was when Yahoo had uh, supported it to some extent um, by providing some um, you know, consulting resources uh, for me to work on it for a while. And they knew about the project, but it was only in 06 when they decided that it was a, uh, a real priority for the company. And they decided to devote engineering teams to it. And so I would say in the, you know, 06, 07 is when Hadoop went from being the the best thing you could get, but not all that great, to being something that was suitable for industrial deployment. Okay, and so around 2007, I think Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, many of these other companies, obviously Yahoo, were working on Yahoo. Yeah. We're working on Hadoop. Yeah. Sorry. What, so what were the consequences of so many big players becoming involved on the same project? You know, um, I mean... For the project overall, it was great. I ever you know, the the project went from it, it got a ton of resources in people's time. It got access to workloads and hardware that we never would have gotten without uh, companies coming behind it. Um, people started to build on top of it, like Facebook really took the lead on Hive, for example. Um, overall, it was really spectacular. Like you know, there there were some management issues um, in figuring out uh, who could commit and who couldn't, and so on. But, but Doug led a lot of that stuff and you were know, through, through the Apache foundation. Um, I, it was eventually, a lot of that was eventually worked out. Um, so there, there were, there were a few management issues, but I would say, you know, from a broad enough perspective, it was, it was almost an unalloyed good. Um, huh. it wasn't that great for me personally, simply because ah. you know, I was a grad student at the time and, uh, I had a certain budget of hours that I allowed myself each week to work on this because my, my day job was to actually like do research and, and write papers and so on. Um, and you know, it, I could be effective when it was me and Doug, if I'm only working a few, working say 15 hours a week. But if there's like a team of 20 guys on the other side who are finding and fixing bugs before I can even log in next, uh, my, my, my time as a productive member of Hadoop was going down at that point. Well, I'm surprised you didn't, recombobulate your priorities <laughs> Did, were, were, were you were you just you just you were just like well there's this world changing project i'm kind of involved in i i, I just don't have time for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know i mean in retrospect uh, i mean <laughs> I'm, no, I'm I mean, not, I don't I'm say that as a criticism. I just say, like, I'm genuinely curious what was going on in your brain at the time. <laughs> um, I would say. I, okay, yeah, it's a good question. 
I saw the potential for a ton of industrial impact, but I didn't see any impact. I, I didn't see what should have been obvious, which was the opportunity for kind of like um, intellectual impact on how people would build systems. I, I thought this is a great implementation. It's going to be really popular, but my job is to come up with some new idea for my thesis. <laughs> and, and I should really focus on the new ideas. And, you know, that wasn't, I mean, I, on the one hand, you can kind of say, oh, that was, that was kind of a, a missed opportunity. I, I don't actually think of it that way. You know, we, from starting in an 02 to going to 07, which is really the, the last time I did any work on um, so the, the Hadoop, you know, except for a bug patch every now and then. Early 07 was the last time I was really involved in it. I, I, I'd been working on the search engine stuff for five years at that point. I, I was happy that it was being adopted. Um, I mean, it, it felt like time to, to move on to something a little bit different. Yeah, so one of the ongoing themes we have on this show is the kind of dichotomy between, uh, I guess, academic basic science and the, I guess, applied implementation side of things. And I also have this debate with my older brother all the time because yeah. he's, uh, he's, he's stayed in academia. Um, he's still in academia. Uh, and, um, and so, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious where... How you know these days? How you see the dividing line? You know, you've got all these all these giant companies like Facebook and Google, and they have these these enormous research arms that do something that looks a lot like basic research a lot of times. Although obviously the end goal is to productize something, yeah. but um, you know, where do you see the the modern dividing line between uh, academic basic research and the applied implementation side, or or is there a dividing line? Well, certainly, I mean, you can you can find people who are only interested in pure research ideas. I mean, they want to write papers and they are not interested in the impact of the work and they think they can do something that does not involve writing software. And that's true in a lot of areas, you know, not areas that I work in necessarily, but, but in large areas, certainly ones that are more mathematically focused, you can do that. And there's certainly people who are interested in pure engineering. They know that it's possible to build what they're trying to build, um, but they enjoy doing it. Uh, or it hasn't been done. It hasn't been done before, but it's very likely they can build in, so they go ahead with it. But for me, what I've seen in the last you know, fifteen plus years is that the projects with the biggest impact are the ones that do both of these simultaneously. That have an element of system building and an element of intellectual contribution. And in the end, you can do them in either venue. You know, I, I don't. I, I think you actually. I, I think the distinction between. Um, industrial and academic work in this area is largely self-imposed. It just happens to be that people in the university generally tend to be more interested in papers and people in industry generally tend to be more interested in, in the working software. It doesn't have to be that case. There, there's plenty of people in academia who build like very large pieces of working software. Um, I, I, in that, that Lorica interview, I talked about the deep dive system. That, that's an example uh, that, that I participate in, although it's largely led from Stanford. And then in the, in the industrial world, there are people who do scientific work that looks an awful lot like something that previously might have happened in a university. So I, I, to me, it's more that if you want the biggest possible impact on the world, you have to use both weapons. And there's always a way to figure out how to do it, no matter which, you know, no matter which kind of uh, venue you're in. Hmm. Very interesting. So I, I want to get back to the discussion of Hadoop and uh, talk about the architectural development of Yarn. So uh, version one of Hadoop suffered from the fact that the MapReduce component had too many responsibilities. What were the consequences of the MapReduce component having too many responsibilities? Well, you know, this, this yeah, I, I think you're referring to the fact that you know, the programming model of MapReduce and the deployment of processing tasks across the cluster were all one monolithic piece of software, right? And, and this was really, th this is one manifestation of this idea that the, 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 the imagined role for MapReduce had shifted over time. Originally, MapReduce was simply one thing. That is, people write MapReduce programs, we got to run the thing. As time went on, it became clear that <clears throat> MapReduce could be an execution infrastructure for many other systems, like you know, uh, Hive or Pig or one of these other things. Uh, it also became clear that there were uh, um, scheduling ta challenges that were pretty sophisticated and you might want to swap in one scheduler for another. So 
what I mean to say is the notion of what was happening on the cluster had shifted. P MapReduce eventually became seen as just one of the many things you could do on the cluster. And some of the functionality that was baked into the old version of the MapReduce code, which is to say, figuring out like, which node should I grab right now to do a bunch of work? Uh, where does it send its data? That I, the idea that that was even, you know, that functionality, the idea that it could be used across many different tasks, didn't become clear until a few years after the original MapReduce uh, implementation. Um, Microsoft Research had a project called Dryad, <clears throat> which I, I, I never used it because I never had, I, it didn't become open source until fairly late in its life. But I, uh, I read about it, you know, um, in, in paper format, and it was a great system. I, it, it was really interesting. It, it had a very clean distinction between what you, you the, the programming model that it exposed and then the execution framework. Um, and to me, that idea, the distinction between the execution and um, what you want the programmer to do is really kind of at, at the core of a lot of the uh, Hadoop re-architecture stuff. Ah, uh, okay. So, and that's, I guess that's what led to the ability for all these other applications to be built on top of Yarn, since there was this uh, more clean separation of concerns right. after the re-architecture. I, I, that, that's right. I, I, uh, a similar but not exactly identical point is when you're trying, if you have flexibility in how you implement one of these programs, like let's say you want a data flow that doesn't look like the traditional MapReduce I, uh, you know, flow of data from the disk to the mappers and then from the mappers to the shuffle stage and then from shuffle to reducer. If you want, let's say, to have five loops of that in a row because you're doing some kind of machine learning iteration style task, you know, that data flow graph can be a lot more complicated than MapReduce ever imagined. And if you try to implement everything as a MapReduce thing, you know, you can do it like Pig kind of ties itself in knots trying to do this. Uh, I guess Hive does as well. Um, it's not always the most natural way to do it. If you, if you were to rip open the guts of a database engine, like a distributed database engine, you would see a distinction between figuring out what should be computed and how I grab all the resources. To me, a lot of the, the MapReduce re-architecture stuff is an effort to kind of um, bring that into the, the Hadoop world. We've talked mostly about the past of Hadoop. I'd like to talk some about the present and the future. What are the most relevant discussions that you see going on around the modern Hadoop stack? Well, I mean, the biggest one from the last few years, of course, has been Spark. Like, um, Spark, Spark has had a, an unbelievable impact on things, and, uh, and rightfully so in a lot of ways. You know, people were using MapReduce in a way that the MapReduce implementation was not really keeping up with. Right. Um, to me, you know, Spark is, is okay. It's an okay drop-in replacement for MapReduce. Um, the thing, if you talk about it from a performance point of view, you know, the performance delta, like, it's there, but it's not so thrilling that I'm willing to drop everything to go for it, right? Like, it's real, <clears throat> but usually if you're, if you're buying into a whole new infrastructure, you want to see 10x plus kind of improvements. And you see that in some cases, but it's but that's maybe because you're going from disk to RAM and so on. You know, uh, that, that stuff's okay. The the part about about Spark that I really like is the interaction model, the kind of terminal uh, way of programming with it. That to me is way better than the like, compile my jar with the MapReduce program and see what happens. So so when I use when I, I use Spark sometimes, um, and when I do it, I, I'm I'm just thrilled by that terminal kind of interaction. Um, the rest of it, it, it's okay. I don't, I, you know, it's good. Glad it exists. Um, but when I think about like a lot of the stuff that's on the table for performance, like taking advantage of, let's say like the memory hierarchy or the different levels of cache or different hardware operations, uh, I feel like Spark's leaving a bunch of stuff on the table. Now I know there's new projects within Spark like this, um, what is it called? Tungsten? Tachyon? Uh, I thought it was Tungsten. Am I thinking of something different? Uh, okay, I, I'm not sure. I, I know that there are some efforts within the Spark universe to take advantage of uh, some of the things I'm talking about, but but those to me seem like the next opportunity for really massive performance gains. 
And mm -hmm. whatever system I'm using, I would like for that, for those, for it to focus on those things. Like mm -hmm. memory hierarchy and you know, uh, hardware instructions. What are the challenges to doing something with with the memory hierarchy that um I mean th so is this, is this kind of like at the at the HDFS level you're talking about? Oh, I'm talking about uh, other I should be more specific about that. Um one of the I guess if you're talking about Spark you're not talking about HDFS. Yeah, not necessarily. Um one of the workloads that you see a lot are machine learning training style workloads and they have a very particular way of iterating over the data that if you were to incorporate notions of ca of the different le levels in the cache, you could potentially do much better at than simply naively iterating over everything in one big pass every time. Mm -hmm. So if you can expose part of that workload, <clears throat> like if you can somehow at the programmers, can the, if the programmer can somehow expose to the system, I uh, here is say a vector of weights that I will be updating many, many times so please don't get rid of the, this from the cache. Um, or alternatively, when I'm iterating over the entire data set, maybe I can iterate over it in a certain pattern that will uh, allow me to efficiently block it in cache. Then there are opportunities for really um, large performance boosts. And there's lots of good academic papers in the last few years about exploiting that stuff. But... You know, if you want to make it a general purpose programming framework, you would need support for that in the actual software. And, and I should say, you know, the at, the at least on the research side, a lot of the Spark guys are aware of this. They may have implemented that. I don't mean to say that they haven't done it, but certainly the like the first version of Spark and the, the one that has become popularized did not have that. That wasn't core to Spark's value proposition. That to me is like the, the next really exciting thing uh, in terms of squeezing the most juice out of these clusters. And I whether it's Spark or some other vehicle, that, that's what I would like for there to be good programming support for. What do you see changing at the storage layer? Like the H, replacing HDFS potentially, or, I mean, you said earlier, you don't, you're don't you not sure if HDFS will be around. Oh no, Map, I, mean, I said MapReduce. I'm actually very confident in HDFS. HDFS is gonna be a cockroach. I don't think it's ever going away. Oh, I, oh okay. <laughs> Map, MapReduce, I think is gonna probably shrink to zero or near zero in terms of usage. I think HDFS or something like it is going to be around for a very long time. I, the, the idea of, the, of a distributed, low-cost, hierarchical file, uh, file system that exposes a hierarchical Unix-style interface to the user, that's going to be around forever. Yes. There's, a, there's a handful of, kind of performance improvements you'd like to have. Mm. Like, you know, can, I, uh, can I have indexing support somehow integrated with the file system? Um, that's not a new idea for, for HDFS, you know, file system style indexing that was there, like in the, the old aborted version of windows Vista. Remember like there was WinFS or something. I think that was what it was called. The, the idea of integrating the file system with a data, with data based style views has been, a, been with us for many, many years. Um, you still might want that for Hadoop, given that database style workloads are very popular on HDFS. So there's maybe a more compelling case there than there ever was for windows. Um, so that's that's like an extension that I can imagine being really helpful, and and I should say I that again might also be something that people are working on right now. I don't I don't mean to say that that's not happening, and someone should work on it. I, I don't I don't necessarily know if that that's the place the case, but if you think of HDFS as combining the Unix style file interaction, like you know it's hierarchical, there's like permission bits, there's multiple users with cheap implementation so that I'm not paying too much extra per gigabyte in exchange for robustness. I think that's not going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, you know, I did a, an interview, uh, about Cassandra recently. And, uh, one of the, the things that came up was we were discussing, uh, you know, what are the properties of a distributed system that requires a coordinator, like a, like a name node? Um, could Hadoop have been designed without a name node, without like a central uh, central coordinator? Well, you want a notion of some kind of name node. <clears throat> what I mean to say is the name node's job in life, one of its most important jobs is to keep and maintain sort of the database of liveness, meaning to figure out which nodes are out there, 
who have I had a heartbeat with recently? Um, who can I give work to when a client wants a, wants a chunk, right? And that table has to exist. So you can have a single node maintain that data, or you can have a group of nodes maintain it, or you can have some kind of cooperative mechanism by which the entire pool of ma new nodes maintains it. To me, that's really just a tech, like a, a trade-off between complexity and like the technical win that you get. It probably makes sense. Like nowadays, no one runs a single name node anymore. Um, there is a group of machines who collaborate on the role of the name node. But does it really have to be the entire cluster? Like, because does any node in the whole machine have to be able to step in as name node? Eh, probably not. Like, you, pr it's probably not strictly necessary. And so there's a, a trade-off in terms of the complexity of the implementation versus, like, what you gain with that. Mm. And so the original implementation in HDFS, which is, like, there's one machine and, hey, if you don't like if that machine doesn't go right, then you're really out of luck. It's probably going too far in one end of the spectrum. But... Um, I never wish that we had made it like totally masterless, for example. Sure, sure. Got it. Okay, so I'd like to start wrapping up uh, by talking about the kind of work that you're doing right now. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, you talked about this in, in some of the Ben Lorick interview, uh, but I would like to, like to talk a little bit about Deep Dive. Yeah, sure. So what, what is Deep Dive and, and what led you to work on it? Well, you know, I, I've been on the research side, I've been working on so-called information extraction for a long time. <clears throat> information extraction, broadly speaking, is analyzing some kind of unstructured data set that could be text or tables or images and creating a structured data set out of it. Um, that problem has been around since at least the early 90s. I worked on it in the you know, throughout the 2000s. And it's useful for a bunch of different things. One vision, and, and of course, it's, it, the reason it's useful is that there's a vast amount of information that's in an unstructured format. I, a lot of the data, a lot of the frustration of HDFS is we have this big system. It's really cheap. I'm going to pour in all my data, create this data lake or data swamp or whatever you want to call it. There's a ton of interesting data in there. I really know all the SQL queries I want to write against it, but it's in some weird text format. I don't even know where all the files are. Like if, it were, if it were a real database, then I'd be cooking with gas. Of course, it can't be a real database. The whole reason that the data lake exists is that it's cheap to add data to. And so this notion, the, the old database model of like, you get your database administrator together, you decide what the schema is going to be, then you populate that schema. That's great for getting clean data, but it leaves a ton on the, a lot of data on the table. Like a lot of data is never going to fit into the schema you designed. You have to figure out that schema in advance before you actually look at the data and figure out what the cool queries are. So it's really restrictive. With the data lake, we're at least which is usually implemented using some form of HDFS just because it's so inexpensive, at least we're collecting all the data, but we can't necessarily query it. In order to go from unstructured data to something you can query, you really need information extraction. That is something that can translate in an automatic way everything that's in that raw data file to something that looks like a high quality table to a human observer. And the problem of information extraction has always been, how can you do that in a way that gets great data quality, but also retains a reasonable cost in doing it? You know, in principle, I could just go hire tons of human beings to read every byte on my file system and copy into a database. And there's some cases in real life where the data is so high value that they've actually done that. Okay. Um, but of course, even that is not perfect because human beings make mistakes. Um, if you tell them the schema to populate on day one, you know, on day 1000, they've got the first, they've, they're done. Then on day 1001, you realize, oh, actually, I told you the wrong thing. You got to go do a different schema. Now you got to rerun that whole thing again, right? Um, what you would love to have is an automatic mechanism that can get data quality that's at least as good as, but maybe could even be better than human beings, but you could just run it instantaneously so that you can try out schema number one, get good data. If you don't like schema number one, tweak it a little bit. Now you got schema number two. Maybe you add another, a new column. Maybe you had an old column that was not totally well-defined. Um, the example I give here is like, uh, in my medical notes, I used to extract doctor, but what I really wanted was doctor, medical doctor and chiropractor, right? So that might not have been obvious to you. The, if you if you had hired like 100 human beings and you just said, go get doctor, uh, they probably were not distinguishing between like traditional medical doctors and chiropractors. Okay, so... 
the reason Deep Dive, which was created initially by my, my friend Chris Ray, who's a professor at Stanford, um, I, he started that a number of years ago. I, I joined in on the project uh, about two years ago, and we've since you know, done some academic work and also created a company around it. Um, the thing about Deep Dive that's so exciting to me is that it's the first system I've seen in information extraction that can reliably get accuracy rates that look like a human being's. So, so I've worked on information extraction systems in the past that do a good job, but you know their accuracy rates are not quite human level. And that means that the resulting database that comes out of it, you can't really use it for everything that you would like. I, it's good for some things. I, one project that I worked on as part of my PhD work um, has, you know, a, has become um, part of a Google search. Uh, so like if you do certain kinds of Google queries, and the information can be found in a table. We extract that information from a table, and it'll or this, Google will present that information in a tabular way to you. And that's like half of one percent of queries, or something like you know. I I I run into it every once in a blue moon when I'm using Google. <laughs> that it's great. It, that's great in like a web search setting where like the accuracy it's good, but you know if it's not perfect, hey, nothing really bad happens. If you do that in certain kinds of like corporate analytical settings, and the data is not really good then you get a really weird answer that leads no one to trust it. Uh, and so deep dive is really exciting because on a lot of different topics, like scientific papers in different areas, we've done it on like um, uh, material science, bioinformatics. Um, we've done it on web text, on classified ads that are really messy. We've, done it, we, we've applied deep dive to a bunch of different areas. Uh, you can reliably get it to a very high level of accuracy and then enable almost any downstream um, workload on the resulting data table. So really, so if you, if you think that collecting unstructured data is something the world's going to do more of, that seems like a pretty safe bet to me, then, then Absolutely. information extraction is one thing you're going to want to have. That's great. Well, um, you know, we'll try it. We should definitely do a show on, on deep dive in the future. We'll look that would be great. to finding a good, good guess for that. Uh, yeah. So Mike Caffarella, thanks so much for coming on to software engineering daily. This has been an awesome conversation. Uh, and thank you so much for your contributions to the open source community. Oh, thanks a lot, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>